Well, hello, students. Uh, welcome to book nine. Uh, as hopefully your teacher went over with you, we're jumping to book nine. Um, and what we're happening here, what's happening here is Odysseus is at a party um, with the king Alcinous and his people. Um, and he has just been asked to um, reveal who, who he is because during this party, um, he um, has some great feats and he starts crying when a singer starts talking about um, Troy and singing about Troy. And so the people, the king, they see him crying and in a and curious, they ask him where he's from. And this is his response. So this is going to be Odysseus's story of him getting to this point. So uh, we pick up with Odysseus halfway through his story. And then he's going to tell the backstory. And then we'll move on from there in a couple of chapters. So just in case you're confused, that's what's going on here. So this is Odysseus responding to um, the king and his people. Um, and just another quick note, I um, had a little bit of feedback, which I really appreciate the feedback, that I was going a little too quickly and not explaining my comments. So I'm going to do them a little bit differently um, today than normal. And if let me know if you like it, and we'll go from there. Okay, cool. So we'll start here. Then resourceful Odysseus. Let me get my thing here, sorry. Uh, actually, I want a different one. We're going to do that one. Then resourceful Odysseus spoke in turn and answered him. O oh, great Alcanoos, preeminent among all people, surely indeed is a good thing to listen to a singer, such as the one who is before us, who is like the gods in his singing. For I think there is no occasion accomplished that is more pleasant than when festivity holds sway among the among all the populace. There's no better there's no nicer time, right? There's no better time than when people are partying. All the people are partying. That's what populace means there. In the feasters up and down the houses are sitting in order and listening to the singer, and beside them the tables are loaded with bread and meats. And from the mixing bowl, that's the wine, right? The wine steward draws the wine and carries it about and fills the cups. This seems to my own mind to be the best of occasions. So I'm going to put over here um, that uh, the, that um, Odysseus is saying that this is the best times when there's a singer and feasting. All right, so there you go. The best times involve a singer and feasting. But now your wish was inclined to ask me about my mournful sufferings, so that I must mourn and grieve even more. What then shall I recite to you first of all? What leave till later? So what should I tell you? You've asked me to tell you what's going on. So what should I tell you? What should I leave till later? Many are the sorrows the gods of the sky have given me. Now first I will tell you my name, so that all of you may know me, and hereafter escaping the day without pity, be your friend and guest, though the home where I live is far away from you. All right, so he's going to tell them his name first, so they can be friends. I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known before all men for the study of crafty designs. In other words, I am the smart one. I made the Trojan horse. I'm the crafty one. I design things. And my fame goes up to the heavens. I'm at home in sunny Ithaca. I should have circled that Ithaca is Odysseus's home. There is a mountain there that stands tall, tall, leaf trembling Nerodus, and there are islands settled around it, lying one very close to each other. So Ithaca is an island. Moving on, there is Delucian and Same, wooded Zycanthios, but my island lies low and away, last of all in the water towards the dark. So if it's last on the, all the way towards on the dark, uh, towards the dark, that would be to the west, right? It's the last of all towards the dark. 
with the rest below facing east and sunshine, a rugged place, but a good nurse of men. For my part, I cannot think of any place sweeter on earth than Lublot to look at. So Odysseus loves his home. All right, so you can see right there, Odysseus loves his home. For in truth, Calypso, shining among divinities, kept me with her in hollow caverns, desiring me for her husband. And so, in the same way, Circe, the Galvaro, detained me behind her in the halls, desiring me for her husband. So, I mean, it looks here like Odysseus is pretty popular with the ladies, right? So, um... Yeah. You can see here that Odysseus is detained by two women. All right, moving on. Um, but never could she persuade the heart within me. So it is that nothing is more sweet in the end than the country and the parents ever. Even when far away one lives and one lives in a fertile place when it is his alien country far from his parents but come i will tell you the voyage home and its many troubles which zeus inflicted on me as i came so odysseus is going to start telling his story here <clears throat> from ilion the wind took me and drove me ashore at ismaros by the Caconians. i sacked their city and killed their people and out of their city, taking their wives and many possessions, <clears throat> and shared them out so that none might go cheated of his proper portion. There I was for the light foot and escaping, and urged it. In other words, Odysseus here wanted to escape, but they were greatly foolish and would not listen. His men were greatly foolish and would not listen. And then there was much wine being drunk. And they slaughtered many sheep on the beach and the lump, lumbering of horn curved cattle. So over here, you can see Odysseus. Um, he wants to plunder and run. So here, Odysseus wants to plunder and run, but his men don't want to do that. They want to party by the beach. But meanwhile, the Caconians went and summoned other Caconians. Okay, so the other Caconians, they're summoning them. Who were their neighbors living in the island country? More numerous and better men. Better men meaning that they were better at fighting. It says right here, skilled in fighting men with the horses, but knowing too at the knee of the battle on foot. So they could fight on horse and on foot. They came at the early morning like flowers in season or leaves. And the luck that came our way from Zeus was evil to make us unfortunate so that we would have hard pains to suffer. So Zeus gave them bad luck. Okay. Zeus. You could say another way to say Zeus did not bless them. Okay. Both sides stood and fought their battles there by the running ships. And with the bronze-headed spears, they cast at each other. And as long as it was early and the sacred daylight was increasing, okay, so that would obviously be morning. Long we stood fast and fought them off, though there were more of them. But when the sun had gone to the time for unyoking the cattle, I already put that in here this afternoon. So I, when it turned afternoon, then at last the Caconians turned the Achaeans back and beat them. So now the Caconians are winning. And out of each ship, six of my strong grief companions were killed. So six, so the average was six men per ship were killed. But the rest of us fled away from death and destruction. So he loses a lot of men there. From there, we sailed on further along, glad to have escaped death. But grieving still at heart for the loss of our dear companions, even when... He, even then, I did not suffer the flight of my oar swept vessels until a cry had been made three times for each of my wretched companions who died there on the plain, killed by the Caconians. So what I'm getting here is that even though he's running away, 
Odysseus cries out three times for each fallen comrade. Okay? So he cries out three times for each fallen comrade. Cloud gathering Zeus drove north wind against our vessels in a supernatural storm and huddled under the cloud scuds, land alike in the great water. Night sprang from heaven. The ships were swept along, yawing down the current. The violence of the wind ripped our sails into three or four pieces. So the storm is ripping their ships apart. These then, in fear of destruction, we took down and stowed in the ship's holes. So they put the sail, the the sails away, and rowed them on ourselves until we had made them the mainland. So they had a road to the mainland. They could not trust their sails. There for two nights and two days we lay it up for pain and weariness together, eating our hearts out. But then fair-haired dawn in the morning, in her rounds brought the third day. We, setting the masts upright and hoisting the white sails on them, sat still and let the wind and steersmen hold them steady. And note this right here. And now I would have come home unscathed, unhurt to the land of my fathers. That's Ithaca. But as I turned the hook of Malaya, if I had a map I could show you. It's just kind of you come around. You have to turn to go south to Ithaca. The sea and the current of the north wind beat me off course and drove me pound past Kythera. So Odysseus almost, almost. makes it home here. But unfortunately, he doesn't. He's blown off course, right? And um, and he goes on. Nine days then, I was swept along by the force of the hostile winds on the fishy sea. But on the tenth day, we landed in the country of the lotus eaters, who live on a flowering food and there we set food on the foot on the mainland and fetched water. And I want you guys to just kind of definitely circle the lotus eaters. This comes up a lot of quizzes and tests. Um, the, and the fact that they live on a flowering food, this is important too. What is this flowering food? Well, read on and see what you think it might be. <clears throat> and my, um, we set foot on, on the mainland and fetched water, and my companions soon took their supper there by the fast ships. But after we had tasted food and drink, then I sent some of my companions ahead, telling them to find out what men, eat, eaters of bread, might live here in this country. I chose two men and sent a third with them as a herald. A herald is like a messenger or a person who speaks. My men went on and presently met the lotus eaters. Nor did the lotus eaters have any thoughts of destroying them. Uh, our companions, but only gave them the lotus to taste of. But any of them who ate the honey sweet fruit of the lotus was unwilling to take any message back or to go away, but they wanted to stay there with the lotus eating people feeding on the lotus and forget the way home. One of the more popular questions I ask in seminar, and I want you to think about it starting right now, is what does the lotus? present here. Now we know it's a flower, but then we also know that when Odysseus's men eat this flower, they don't even want to carry a message. They don't want to leave. They want to stay. They only want to stay. So what does it represent? Think about it. What do you think it represents? We'll talk about it. I myself took these men back, weeping, by force to where the ships were and put them aboard under rowing benches and tied them fast then gave the order to the rest of my eager companions to embark the ships the ships in heights for fear someone else might taste of the lotus and forget their way home and the men went quick went quickly aboard and sat on the oarlax sitting well on the and sitting well in the oar in order, dashed the oars at the gray sea. So Odysseus literally had to drag his men back to the ships and tie them down. 
in order to get away from the lotus eaters. So once again, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, longer in the future, but I want you to start thinking about what the lotus would represent. From there, grieving still in my heart, at heart, we sailed on further along and reached the country of the lawless, outrageous Cyclops, who putting all their trust in immortal gods, neither plow with their hands nor plant anything, but all grows for them without seed planting, without cultivation. Cultivation is um, pruning and putting seeds down and just general managing crops. Wheat and barley and also the grapevines, which yield for them wine of strength, and it is Zeus's rain that waters them. In other words, the Cyclops live entirely live entirely I can spell right off the man I really can't spell right right no work required does that sound nice right they don't plant everything grows Zeus waters with them but note here this second part here starting right here these people have no institutions that would be like courthouses schools okay um, things that govern people and help people out no meetings for councils rather they make their habitations in caverns they live in caves among the peaks of the high mountains, and each one is the law for his own wives and children. So each family is governed by the dad and cares nothing about the others. So this is definitely what we call patriarchal society, where the father is in charge of his own family and other people don't mess with that. There's a wooded isle that spreads away from the harbor, neither close in the land of the Cyclops nor far out from it, forested, and wild goats beyond number breed there. Now, the reason I, I underline wild goats here is because the wild goats are kind of what draws them in and gets them in trouble. For there is no coming and going of humankind to disturb them, nor are they visited by hunters who in the forest suffer hardships as they haunt the peaks of the mountain. Neither again is it held by hair of the fox nor farmers, but all it stays, never plowed up and never planted, it goes without people and supports the bleeding wild goats. Now, I want to I wanna just note a theme here that's happening. With the Caconians, eating gets the men in trouble. With the lotus eaters, eating gets the men in trouble. As you're going to see in a second, at the land of the Cyclops, food, wine, cheese, gets them in trouble. Things and gifts and the desire for more things are what ultimately lead Odysseus and his men into trouble here. Let's keep reading and find out how. All right, moving on. For the Cyclops have no ships or cheeks of vermilion. So vermilion is a red color, and uh, in the ancient Greek ships, um, it was it is traditional to paint um, a warship with red and green and bright colors. Nor have they builders of ships among men who could have made them strong bench vessels. And these, if they could have run them sailings to all the various cities of men, in the way that people cross the sea by means of the ships and visit each other. For they could have made this island a strong settlement for them. So what Odysseus is saying here is that if these people would make had made ships, they would have, could have been a strong settlement. So I'll write here, ships would have made, let me just do this a little more neatly, would have made this settlement strong. Now why? Well, because as you can see here, he's saying they have everything else, right? He goes on. 
for it is not a bad place at all. It bears all crop, for it could bear all crops in a season. And there are meadowy lands near the shores of the gray sea, well watered and soft, and there could be grapes grown there endlessly. And there is smooth land for plowing. Men could reap a full harvest always in a season, since there is very rich subsoil. Also, there's an easy harbor with no need for a hawser nor anchor stones to be thrown ashore, nor cables to make fast. In other words, you would do these things here that he's talking about if you're worried that your boat's going to get swept out to sea. But the natural harbor is beautiful, and it makes it so you don't have to do that. One could just run ashore and wait for the time when the sailor's desire stirred them to go, and the right winds are blowing. You could just pull your ship right up on shore, leave it, come back when you want it. That's how good the harbor is. So the land is beautiful and has many benefits, right? The land is beautiful and has many benefits. Also, at the head of the harbor runs bright water. Spring beneath rock, and there are black poplars growing around it. There we sailed ashore, and there was some good guiding us, some God, sorry, guiding us through the gloom of the night. Nothing showed to look at, for there was a deep mist around the ships, nor, wa nor was there any moon showing in the sky, but she was under the clouds and hidden. There was none of us there whose eyes had spied out the, the island, and we never saw any long waves rolling in and breaking on the shore. But the first thing was when we benched the well-benched vessel. So they're coming in under pitch black. It is pitch black. <clears throat> then, after we beached the ships, we took all the sails down, and we ourselves stepped out into, break, into the break of the sea beach, and there we fell asleep and waited for the divine dawn. But when dawn, the young dawn, showed again with her rosy fingers, we made a tour about the island, admiring everything. And there, the nymphs, the daughters of Zeus of the Ages, remember, that's a Greek thing. These are, these are maidens of the forest, started the hill-roving goats our way for my companions to feast on. So the nymphs send the goats. Now, is this on purpose? I don't know. I think so. So they send the goats, and at once we went and took from the ships curved bows and javelins with long sockets and arranged ourselves in three divisions to cast about. So they're going to they're gonna shoot them, and they're going to throw spears at the goats. And the God granted us the game we longed for. Now, there were twelve ships that went with me, and for each one, nine goats were portioned out, but I alone had ten for my portion. So, so they had twelve times nine plus one. Okay, they got a lot of food. So for the whole length of the day until the sun's setting, we sat there feasting on unlimited meat and sweet wine. For the red wine had not yet given out in the ships, and there was still some left, for we had taken a great deal in the storing jars when we stormed the Caconian sacred citadel. So, lots of goats. Plus wine equals party. All right, that's what they're doing. They're enjoying the goats and the wine. And we looked across at the land of the Cyclops, and they were nearby, and we saw their smoke and heard the sheep and the goats bleeding. But when the sun went down and the sacred darkness came over, then we lay down to sleep along the break of the seashore. But when, the, but when the young dawn showed again at her rosy fingers, then I held a simply and spoke forth before all. All right, so Odysseus is going to address them. What's he going to want? Any guesses? What has been getting them in trouble? Well, let's read on. Let's find out. The rest of you who are my eager companions, wait here. While I, with my own ship and the companions that are in it, go to find about these people and learn what they are. 
whether they are savage and violent, without justice, or hospitable to strangers, with the minds that are godly. Now, if a person's godly or does the right thing in this culture, right? Okay, they're going to give gifts. So O wants to know what he can get. You don't believe me? Let's read on. Okay? He wants to know what he can get from these people. That's what I'm telling you right now. Well, let's keep reading and I'll show you my proof. So speaking, I went aboard the ship and told my companions also to get aboard and cast off the stern cables. And quickly they went aboard the ship and sat to the oarlocks and sitting well in order, dashed the oars in the gray sea. But when we had arrived at the place which was nearby at the edge of the land, we saw a cave close to the water, high and overgrown with laurels, and it, in it were stabled great flocks, sheep, and goats alike. And there was a fenced yard built around it with a high wall of grubbed out boulders and tall pines and oaks with lofty foliage. It's a big fence and a yard, right? It's a cave with a big, you know what I'm going to call it, wall. <clears throat> Inside, there lodged a monster of a man who was now herding the flocks at a distance away alone, for he did not range with the others. He did not hang out with the other cyclopses, but stayed away by himself. His mind was lawless. He did not follow laws. And in truth, he was monstrous, a monstrous wanderer made to behold, not like a man and eater of bread, but more like a wooded peak of the high mountain seen standing away from the others. So he towers above the others, literally. So he literally towers like a mountain. Okay, a huge man. At that time, I told the rest of my companions to stay where they were beside the ship and guard it. Meanwhile, I, cho I choosing out the 12 best men and my, my companions, went on. But I had with me a goat skin bottle, black wine, sweet wine, given me by Maron, son of Yantes and priest of Apollo, who bestrides as Meros. He gave it because, respecting him with his wife and his child, we saved him from harm. So he has a gift. It's Odysseus has wine and we're about to find out this is not just any type of wine this is a very special wine he made his dwelling among the trees of the sacred grove of apollo and he gave me glorious presents he gave me seven talents of red gold and he gave me a mixing bowl made of all silver and he gave along with it wine drawing it off storing jars 12 bottles of wine this was sweet wine unmixed a divine drink Unmixed means that um, no water is added. When they, when they mix the wine, as we've read so many times, they add water and they add other things to kind of spice up the wine. Some spices, maybe cinnamons and these types of things to make it a, a wine that you would drink. But this is unmixed. None. No, no one of his servants or thralls that were in his household knew a single thing about it. Only himself, his dear wife, and a single housekeeper. So this is such a good wine that it's kept secret from everybody. Whenever he drank this honey sweet red wine, he would pour out enough to fill one cup. And then twenty measures of water were added, and the mixing bowl gave off a sweet smell, magical. Then would be no pleasure in holding off. So can you imagine a 1 to 20 dilution of the wine is normal? That's a strong wine. And here's the whole point with this whole wine. This is the good stuff. This is the best stuff you can get. The best wine. And he's taking it with him. Of this, I filled a great wineskin full and took two provisions in a bag. For my proud heart had an idea that presently I would encounter a man who was endowed with great strength 
and wild with no true knowledge of laws and customs. So this wine is almost like a bribery tool or some kind of tool that he thinks is going to help him when he meets this great man. Lightly, we made our way to the cave, but we did not find him there. He was off herding on the range with his fat flocks. We went inside the cave and admired everything else in it. Baskets were there, heavy with the cheeses, and the pins crowned with lambs and kids. They had all been divided into separate groups, the firstlings in one place, and then the middle ones and then the middle ones and the babies again by themselves. So what's going on here is he's dividing them into adults, young firstlings, so young uh like uh, you know them growing and then the babies into the next one all right and all this all his vessels milk pails and pans that he used for milking into were running over with whey in other words this is like rich in here i mean this is milk and food and and all sorts of good stuff here. And from the starts, my companion spoke to me and begged me to take some of the cheeses and come back again. And the next time to drive off the lambs and the kids from their pens and get back quickly to the ship again and go sailing off across the salt water. So this time, Odysseus' a companions want to move quickly. So O's. It looks like Q, doesn't it? O's. Want to move quickly. Now, note Odysseus does not hear, but I would not listen to them. It would have been better their way, not until I could see him, to see if he would give me presents. My friends were to find the sight of him in no lovely way. In no way lovely. This is my evidence right here. Odysseus comes with wine and he wants presents. O wants gifts. And you're going to see the consequences of Odysseus wanting things. Uh, when Miss Carr picks up starting here on 231. So there's a few themes to talk about here in the in this part. First of all, Odysseus is telling his story, and he's doing it in a way that kind of tells us a little bit about him. Odysseus is wise, but he's not always wise. And at the end of the story here, he's making the same mistake that his companions made several times before. He's allowing his desire for food and things and objects to get the better of his judgment, right? Greed is what is happening here. And um, just pay attention to what this greed is going to do um, in the second half of this chapter. All right? Um, if you have any questions, ask me or one of your teachers, and take care. Bye.